Thank you, Ben. Um, so it is a completely different talk, but um, I, as you saw in the first two lectures, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of using distances, but you need distances, but you need something more. And I'm going to talk, try to talk to two audiences. Um, first of all, to the biologists who care about the microbiome, which I now consider my day job. And a little bit to the mathematicians um, as well, because there are methods which also have the problems I'm going to talk about, um, which are mathematical problems. And I'm not going to give you only solutions. That is, there are areas which are wonderful open areas for research um, at many levels. So it might be um, of interest to you if you're looking for an open problem. So in the microbiome work I'm going to present, this is sort of very serious work. It's in a clinical setting of trying to predict preterm birth or trying to understand the effect of multiple courses of antibiotics. And so this research was funded by a grant that I have with David Relman um, called a Transformative Research Award um, with the NIH to look at longitudinal studies of perturbations in the microbiome and also um, money from the March of Dimes and now the Gates Foundation um, where we're trying to study preterm birth. It's very surprising to me um, that there are so many open problems, things that people don't understand, and also such a low uh, quality of success rate somehow in developed countries when it comes to um, birth and maternal care. <coughs> so a little bit, yesterday I talked about heterogeneity, and we saw some ways of dealing with it. I talked about propagation and visualization of error, a little bit about tree and graph integration, and just to show you in my you know, scheme of things, today we're going to talk a lot about poor data quality and information leakage. And I might get to talking a little bit about reproducibility, and tomorrow we'll talk about interpretability. So preterm birth um, prediction, this is a very surprising map. You see that the U.S. Um, is like many countries, um, sub-Saharan Africa, um, where you have more than uh, 10 uh, preterm births per 100 births. And uh, 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 many countries like Canada and Europe and Australia have less than 10 preterm births per live births. So this is a problem in many parts of the world, and it's very surprising that you'd have in the U.S., which is supposed to be a developed country with high quality of health care, so many cases. And that's why um, there's been a, a, the currently research on the diagnosis and trying to understand preterm birth. So it's in this context that we did several studies. Um, we're following uh, women during their pregnancy, and uh, we had in this study 49 pregnant women. 40 of the women were followed in the sort of test um, data set, and then we used another nine <laughs> as our validation set for this study. And we had different microbiome sites. I showed you the map last time of the different trees across the different sites. This one, the, the swabs, the vaginal swabs, which we're going to be studying for their species abundances and occurrences, um, is the, the main focus of this part of the talk. We used in this study quite sophisticated methods for denoising the data, variance stabilization, and various kinds of models, and I will talk to you about that. But you know, it was a success in, in that we were able actually to detect important differences, and I'm going to explain to you um, what we did. So we did a careful probabilistic model um, that we now use uh, as a standard for going from the raw reads to saying which are the what we call strain variants or amplicon strain variants. And we have a um, R program called Data2, which we developed, and we also do a lot of variant stabilization, um, which tries to remove some of what the 
statisticians called heteroscedasticity, which basically means that the variance changes from point measurement to measurement, and that's very difficult to deal with um, because you can't sort of globally make confidence statements until you've taken that into account. What we want to do is try to look at differential abundance between two groups, the groups who deliver preterm and the groups who deliver at term, and try to find out if there's differences in the microbial communities, and in particular, are there any bi particular ones or biomarkers that we could... So this is done with David Rollman and my postdoc at the time, Ben Callahan. And we had lots of questions, so you, very often you have to start with what clearly what the questions are so that you can know whether you're able to answer some of them or all of them. One of them was, you know, are there community state types the same that was seen in previous studies? So that was already something which was well understood um, in studies which involved not only next generation sequencing data but also Sanger sequencing. How stable are the communities across the three trimesters of pregnancy? And um, a little bit about the dynamics of the changes and could we predict um, preterm birth from these dynamics? We did look at the changes that are at delivery, but that's not some, what I'm going to talk about. So here are the samples from all the different women put together. So there are multiple samples per woman. And um, what I'm showing you is what I'd call a dissimilarity matrix, and it is based on... Um, <laughs> the dissimilarity between the samples and this stochastic block model type structure shows that you have communities quite distinct for four of them. So you have this one state type here where you, within this um, all these samples are very, very similar. So similar means a distance very close to zero with um, a Jacquard-type distance. Here we have communities. This is another state type. This is two. This is in green. And then three. And then um, we have this last one, um, four, which is quite distinct. And then we have one which is very messy. And so the samples within that fourth group, you know, they're not similar to anything in particular. It's very, very heterogeneous. So this is um, uh, this special group four is what we're going to concentrate on. If you look at the different state types with regards to whether they had preterm birth or not, you'll see that the prevalence of the pink, which is the samples where there's preterm birth, is much higher in group four, that pink group, um, than any of the other groups. There are quite a few. Those group one is the biggest group. There are some preterm birth in that group as well. But it's definitely the case that, you know, if you were to do a, a test, that you would see that the, this is definitely a group of interest. And so we're going to concentrate on that group. And if we look at the occurrences of the different species of bacteria within those groups, um, some of the groups are very, very simple. They just have pre predominance of one species. So we have um, Lactobacillus crispatus um, is a species which really characterizes group one. And um, in group three, we have a Lactobacillus with inus, which is a different um, type of Lactobacillus, but also very specific to that group. And the Lactobacillus sort of explain all one, two, four, uh, one, two, three, and five, and group four is a highly diverse community. There's not one dominant bacteria. It's interesting as a, you know, studying microbial ecology, and in particular in the human microbiome, very often in these studies, people say diversity is health. If you have a very diverse gut microbiome, it's a sign of health. And this is a case where it's the opposite. The high diversity is a sign of uh, problem, pathology. Pathology. So, um, so these are, this is the, uh, the these groups, and these groups were actually previously known. So, if you write um, the longitudinal analysis and look at the different measurements that were taken, um, uh, the same uh, woman is each woman is a row, 
And the length of her pregnancy is ended here with the bracket. And so you see the long pregnancies are here and the short pregnancies are here. And mostly, you know, they're not very many. There are a few red points here pink, and then mostly the red and pink points, which are actually subgroups of this problematic group four, and they're associated to the preterm birth, and that's the longitude. So one of the things we thought we'd try to do is you have a pretty um, constant or stationary type distribution in terms of transitions within groups. Um, we just took a simple Markov chain model to try and model the transitions between states and, and see which were the most um, uh, variable. And so you see state one, 98% of the time, it stays the same, so it's extremely stable. And state four is the least stable state. So it's an unstable state, and the passage in and out are about the same, and we wanted to, to study that a little bit further. So we concentrated on group four, um, this more unstable state. So the, the, what we found doing the analysis of the abundances and after doing various kinds of um, regularization or variance stabilization is that the, the, um, you could tell very early um, the presence of a couple of um, community fours could be an early diagnostic tool. That is, it, it wasn't only in that, in previous publications, people had thought that it was in the, that community state four type was problematic only in the third um, trimester, and that's not true. That is, you can diagnose early um, that problem. And you, we have uh, various different types of um, differences within that group four. So when we looked at what we call group four was sort of what it characterized it is very lactobacilli poor. So there were no lactobacilli or very few in that group. So very highly diverse, but very few lactobacilli. And within that, um, that was definitely associated to preterm birth. And we, we were able to find out that there was presence within that group of specific biomarkers. So in this first study, we found Gardnerella and Ureoplasma differential abundances for those who gave preterm birth. So in some sense, there were some um, markers, and I wouldn't say, I can't say that it was causal. We don't know um, exactly you know, the origin of these species and the relationship to the inflammation and the preterm birth. And that's something that we're st studying with immune um, study, but we, we definitely were able to see this, and we validated on the separate set of nine. Um, now, while we were doing this study, we realized that actually we were using uh, something called UPASS, which enabled you to find uh, species level uh, differences in between the bacteria, but things seem to be occurring actually at a strain level and not a species level, and the data were pretty noisy. So after about three or four years of doing statistics on the, these microbiome markers, and in particular, this is called 16S studies. So we study one gene, and we study one variable region of that gene. And that variable region is the fingerprint of the different species. And we realized that we needed something higher resolution, and we wanted to try and solve how do you find out all the information that is within this short string. So this is the, the principle behind data two and a comparison to the existing program um, that was being used within the standard protocol, which is called CHIME and um, UPAS. And so what, what you have is you have a gene which is conserved for the most part in all bacteria. And you have these three regions. Here are some of the regions that one could look at, so this is VC, V6, V7, V8, 
We also use V4 and V5. So they're variable regions. And those regions enable you to find out whether there are differences between um, the different species and hopefully between the strains as well. In fact, when you want to do more strain information, as you'll see, you have to do more work. You have to study more of the genes. So one of the problems um, in the current pipeline is that um, if you're trying to ask questions related to how many different bacteria or bacterial species are present in an environment, it's extremely sensitive to noise. And if you're counting what I'll call spelling errors as different species, then you're going to wildly overestimate the number of um, taxa which are present. So it, 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 these methods are not robust, and I don't like them very well, but this is definitely, on the field coming from ecology, what was called alpha diversity, that is, the number of different species or the, uh, uh, within a sample, and beta diversity is sort of the comparison across different um, locations or samples. Um, they are very dependent on the number of species that you find, and so we wanted to work on, on that. And just a, a parallel for people who don't know any biology whatsoever, the question is akin to asking, you know, how many words does this person know? And you want to try and find out how many words the person knows, and then so you, you collect, you know, all the documents that they've written or handwritten, and then you start sampling and you, you know, collect words, and then these are the words that occur. And some of them are misspellings of other words. And in the era of you know, Google, Google knows how to correct um, misspellings through the frequency with which the known words um, occur. So they're much, much higher. And we're going to use the same method. Um, we use the information about the frequencies. This is not the standard method that was being used for defining taxa. So um, the standard method used a radius, a fixed radius, a fixed distance of, say, 97% similarity. And that is what is used in Chime and um, the original factors. And that was actually the problem. And the problem was if you imagine yourself in a situation. So now this is not discrete data, but I'm going to show you. These are two samples from the same distribution in having the same variance. They have different centers, and you want to find their centers. But in one sample, you have 10,000, and the other red sample, you only have 1,000. So what happens? They have the same variance, but the opportunity for variability multiplies with the number of samples, the number of sequences. So in this case, we have these two sequences, and it looks as if, you know, sample the sequence from the blue samples, you know, they're much, much broader. The variance isn't higher, it's just that there are many, many more of them, so you see a much broader extreme points. So if you take the standard method is to define the OTUs or the taxes by this 97% exactly the same, you see that it's very unfair. That is, you're not using the frequency information. You're not using the fact. You're just pretending that you have, and that's why I say it's the problem of uniformity. You're pretending that you have uniform distribution, and it's not. So these problems that we have is you have a very high false positive, lots of fake new taxa. Um, the, so the number of OTUs is much larger, in fact, than the true richness of the sample. Um, you have low resolution. Um, and so you can't, you know, you don't know things with high precision, and it doesn't scale well. So the timing, um, the, 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 the algorithms used requires the distances to be computed between all the different um, samples, and so it, it, it scales badly computational. So we decided to use a probabilistic model for the error in the samples, and the idea there is here on the left, this is the truth. So you suppose that you have the, the this is reality, and then you you have a certain amount of noise which gets incorporated in the sequencing and amplification and the different steps involved in preparing and then sequencing the data, and so you you see the noisy versions of the original ones, and so that's what 
the Amplicon reads are what's observed. And the standard method then says, I'm going to take uh, balls of radius 97% similarity, and anything within here will be one OTU, and here you have within the other. And so what we decided to do is, well, we'll make a noise model which will train on the data as it comes in, in a sort of EM-type method, and denoise the data. And of course, if you have some, some of the real um, variants are very frequent, so that's like the spelling in, in Google, the most frequent ones will anchor you. And you'll see whether the, 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 the variant is likely to be just a spelling error. If it's only one away from, or two away from something very frequent, it's a spelling error. But if you have something which is really very, you know, 100,000 reads, there might be four away. But that would be in their probabilistic model. And so we make an error model, and we actually incorporated in it all the information that we have. So when you have... Um, DNA sequences, we also have something called the quality score, which tells you as you go along the sequence whether or not um, it's low quality or high quality, and we can incorporate that in our learning algorithm and sort of discount the low quality ones so that they don't mess up the rest. And so you can say, you know, what's the probability that this is a, just an error, a substitution error, or what's the probability that it's actually a true um, variant, and we also incorporate the batch run. So our error model enables us then to denoise the data, because you can make a decision, classification decision, sort of a simple Bayesian um, classifier, whether or not it's a new sequence or whether it should be denoised. And this is just to show you we have um, tools for interactively looking at the quality and deciding well, whether you know, some of the sequences you might even not want to use. And so the error you know, often degrades towards the end of the sequence. Now, the estimation of the transition or the error frequencies are done on the data. The data comes in in very large files. We have between hundreds and thousands to millions of reads in, in a run. And you can learn, in some sense, the transition probabilities as a function of the quality score. So as the quality goes up, as you go to the right here, we have the probability of error goes down. And the errors are not all the same. That is, you have some errors, um, you know, have different types of biases. And so T to C here, you know, you have some error, and T to G, um, and some are less, so G to C and so on. But for every one of those, for every data set, you can look at your profile and look at the noise um, distribution. So the Chime, two, Chime and, and UPASS use this sort of hard threshold, 97%, you know, hamming distance type um, cutoff. And what Data2 does is it sort of um, hugs the curve much better and has a model and you can see with higher resolution different variants. They don't get globbed together. Um, if you have true variants here, we have four true variants. And uh, on simulations of various types, you know, where we know the error, we get very good um, in fact, in this case, you get true, um, the true abundance is perfectly correlated with our estimates. And the big difference is with this strain variant um, uh, differentiation. So we looked at this Lactobacillus crispatus, and uh, the standard at the time was to use UPAS, and that found only one taxa, OTU, one type. And with data two, what you see is you see different strains, and you're able to follow the strains within the patient. So each one of these little segments corresponds to one patient, and each little line is a different sample, a, a different week. And so you see that within a patient, it stays very stable. There are very little changes, but you can track the, train, the strains. This is also very useful for strains of communicable diseases and things like that, because you can... You can do a source, you can track back with a mixture model what the source is. So if you have the strain information, um, it's much more uh, useful. And so 
Then the question comes up, that is, once you've decided the strain, what do you do with the information once it's been denoised? Um, so what we recommend is to be lazy and just keep the whole denoised sequence as your name. Of course, you're not going to use it for, in a readable way, but you want to keep it as the information because you'll look it up later if it comes up as important. And all through these analyses, I always tell people... Um, the, they have to be lazy. That is, um, don't worry that you don't know how to annotate everything in sight. There are going to be 10,000 different possible variants, but only three will matter. But when you get to the three that matter, then you can ask somebody to spend a couple of weeks on those three. But you don't want to spend six months trying to annotate everything in sight. So we try to do that um, this way. And um, we call these amplicone... Um, sequence variants, and that, that's been quite um, useful as a way of changing from the standard um, OTU approach. So then we did follow-up studies, and this was a fight to publish, but it was worth it. So it's very hard to publish in, in math if you have a second proof of something that was already proved, but you know the proof is shorter and more interesting, you can still publish it. In biology, it's very, very hard to publish something that was already published. And this is the reason why um, it, we have so many results which we're not quite sure about because the replication studies are having a hard time being published. So we managed to publish uh, what we called a replication and refinement study, uh, a different sample. So we took different women we took women from Alabama, African-American women, and comparing the two, now you know what a PCOA plot is, we have these um, different um, lactobacillus over there, and you see that the representation, these are the two different species plots where you see the different species or variants, they're extremely similar. That is, the way they articulate between themselves, the co-occurrence plots that you get um, are very, very similar. And so, in some sense, we have a replicate. And then we were able, with this higher resolution, to look at, within the Gardnerella, the reason the, the, for some studies people weren't finding Gardnerella to be significant. And the reason is it has to do with strains. That is, there are strains which are actually associated with preterm birth, and there are strains which are not. And if you just glom everything together, uh, heterogeneity um, kills the significance. And then we did a follow-up study with um, Daniela Goldsman, who went in and did the whole genome of the three different strains and look at their relationship on the phylogenetic tree, um, and, you know, you see that you have, we have different instances according to the color. And so the Gardnerella 1 are the ones which are apart, and Gardnerella 2 and 3 are down here. So you can do a phylogeny after the fact if you have the whole genome. And we've done follow-up studies. We're now trying to see more of the reaction on the immune system and the metabolites involved. But this is, you know, this is quite an um, interesting study here again. This is Daniela's um, phylogenetic tree and the abundances, co-occurrences of different um, genes. So what did we learn from that um, study? That we lost information, we dropped information about frequencies and only used distances, we failed. And this is a very well-known heuristic, which... Um, is a mistake, and there's this wonderful book by Danny Kahneman about the work that he did with Amos Tversky on biases that we have on probability. So it was called the baseline reference um, bias. And the idea, and I think the story that they told in their paper had to do with there's a hit and run in a city, and um, the, uh, the person who saw it didn't know whether it was more of a blue car or a green car that did it. And that when you do that computation, you should take into account how many blue cars and how many green cars are there in the city. And that will help that computation. But that's not how we think about it. 
And even people who think very, very deeply do not get this. And so the, 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 the people I'm thinking about um, in this case, I'll come back to that, um, are mathematicians. So there's a, there's a field which is very popular. I organize several workshops. Um, I, Gunnar Carlson's at Stanford, and we've had 10 years of talking about this, and I could never get him to understand about real data and probability distributions. So let me tell you the story a little bit about this field. So it's called topological data analysis. And in this field, the idea is that data are sets of points, as I pointed out, you know, that lie in some space. And the first thing they do is, well, we're going to make small balls of radius something. So if you have a small ball, it's already that you've gone away from topology. You're already in a geometrical space. So you know a radius, and you're going to make radii around these balls. And then you're going to make the connected components through the simplices and try to find whether there are holes in the data or not. Now, you don't just do it at one radius. You do it at increasing radii. And then you have a whole set of computations on the simplices as to the number of holes. Now, in this case, this is the Czech com complex, this Czech complex, and this is the Rips complex. So these simplices are computed in different ways. This computational problem, which is quite interesting. But, um, and this is, these are slides from Bob Grice, who has a very nice paper in the uh, American, um, in the bulletin of the AMS. And so here is an example where you have data which has, uh, suppose that the data are in a disk with a hole in it, and then you compute you know, the radii, and the, you have the connected simplex here, and as you increase the radii of the balls, then you go on and you're sort of covering more and more, and here you see you have the hole. And so this is also the case. And so all of these computations, and as you go through, you can make what they call barcodes, which are actually the um, Betty numbers associated to all these different simplices, which you can compute. And you can try and find which are the barcodes, which are the Betty numbers, which are persistent, which stay for a long time. And that will tell you what the, uh, you know, how many holes and what the topology of the underlying data space is. However, all of that method, all the methods involved in this um, involve saying, suppose that I have you know, a torus and I have points uniformly distributed on the torus. In the, real, in the real world, there is no such thing. We don't have uniformly distributed points on manifolds, ever. So there's an identifiability problem between the fact that your points might be clustered and so have a difference in density, or you might have very high curvature and you won't be able to distinguish between the two. So all the methods in, in TDA sort of break down for real data. And there's an amazingly interesting math problem or project which would involve how can I make changes of measure of my data. We know how to do it very simply by the inverse CDF transform on one di dimension so that you could bring yourself back to the uniform distribution and then apply TDA. But nobody's done that. And the problem is... I think that there are very few people who speak probability and statistics and, you know, topology or differential geometry, um, methods, measure theory. Um, you know, geometric measure theory is very hard, and there aren't a lot of, there's not a lot of overlap. But it would be, it's a very interesting project. I still have hope that if I say this, there's an interesting open problem. Somebody will be interested. I'm happy to talk to you. But I also like to say it because... We all get this wrong. Even people who are trained in probability are back of the envelope heuristics of the way we think about things is always to suppose <coughs> uniform. And that's the way we think. And I, so I think that it's worth um, thinking about. OK, so now I'm going to, instead of, you know, I won't solve the problem about you know, how to make things back to uniform. I'll do an easier problem, which is, Suppose the points are measured with different variances. So at least, you know, the measurements are made and your variance is different. 
And your data, in fact, you can make it as form, formed by mixtures. And I love this cartoon by XKCD. Here you have student's distribution, which is a favorite with many statisticians. And this is called the teacher's distribution. Okay? So we're, we're going to talk about teacher's distributions, which are mixtures. So our po as I said, and you saw this picture last time, some of our points are measured with different uh, variances. And uh, th this is a nice case, and we're going to sort of inspire, in the sense that the variances seem to be changing smoothly, which is a good point. But points are measured with unequal. So where does that come from in the microbiome is very relevant, because when I said all the samples had reads in them, all the samples have different numbers of reads in them. And so um, if you look at the sample sums for this data, um, you know, the sample CL3 had 864,000 reads in it. And um, you have a data set here, TRSED1 has 58,600. So it means that you have a contingency table in some sense, and the column sums of the contingency tables are unequal. So your measurements of the what you want is the relative abundances. The relative abundances are known with unequal precision, and you, you need to deal with that. So you need to equalize the variance, and you know, the variance is going to be a, a function of this n, the underlying. And this is something that statisticians know how to do, and we use variance stabilizing transformations, and it's related to the delta method, um, for those of you who've taken a, a, a stats course, and I'm going to show you, you know, how we do this in practice. So historically, the people working in the field of the microbiome came from ecology, and they um, were inspired by this clever idea of Sanders from 1968. This idea predates the bootstrap and is sort of the ancestor of the bootstrap idea, where you can subsample to try to understand um, a curve in some sense of um, numbers of species. So if you, you had um, you know, a, a sample size of 200 and you measured um, a first number of species, you could set subsample from that and say, well, suppose I took a sample of only 100 <laughs> from those 200 you know, how many species would I get? And then you would get this number, and this is called a rarification curve. And it's very much the idea behind the bootstrap in some sense. And it's a very clever idea. But this inspired people to say, okay, um, we have this problem that all the column sums in the contingency table are unequal. We, don't, we want to vary a, the variance to be all the same, so we'll just take subsamples so that all the column sums are the same. And um, that's the method called rarifying. So you select the minimum library size, which you think is impossible. So you might discard some of the ones which are less than that. And then, so suppose you say, I want all the samples to be at least 5,000. You drop everything that has less than 5,000 total number of reads. And then you take a subsample size 5,000 of everything. And so that's what rarifying does. And... The other thing that some people do is they just say, well, the real thing that we're trying to measure is proportions or relative abundance, so we just make everything into proportions. And that is not, both of those methods throw away information. So statisticians like to say that if you throw away information, your procedure is probably not admissible. Now, sometimes if you have exchangeability or if you have certain properties, you can throw away information. There's a sufficient statistic that tells you exactly what information you can throw away. And this is, this is not the case here. The other thing that people are confused about in the field is they really want the relative abundance of the different species. So they say the data are the relative abundances, and the relative abundances have to sum to one, and so they have to have all these properties. That's actually not true. The data in statistics are what they are. That's what comes in the door. It's the raw data are the data. You can't lie about that. So you can't say, oh, the data are relative abundances, because that's 
what I measure. But I, I, if you make a move on the data, it's no longer the data. It's transformed data, and that has all kinds of biases and effects. So the data themselves are not compositional, but the parameters, the underlying Ps, are. And so you, have to, you want to make inference about the Ps, but you want to know all the uncertainty in the data. And this comes in a lot because all kinds of things have to be done to that raw data. In particular, we have problems with contaminants. So we have programs, one called Decontam, another called Barbie, which have mixture models which enable you to take out the reagent contaminants. But also, when we study um, the microbiome after antibiotic um, uh, the number of bacteria is going to fall. So in compositional data, if you had a rock which is 10 grams, it's always 10 grams, and you're going to look at proportion of elements in the 10 grams. But in the case of the bacteria, there's not a hole which stays the same. And so you, you don't have that. And we need the read depth when you want to do the estimation of the uncertainty propagation. Um, and so... The data transformation route is the safest route. So we know from doing the delta method that if you make a data, a certain type. To, so if you have a Poisson, you take the square root, the variance can be made to be um, the same. So that's the, the approach that we're going to take. And so the, the other thing that's difficult with microbiome data is, unfortunately, the errors are both multiplicative and additive. And that, that's, that's a real pain. Um, and one of the ways around this uh, is to use, you take out the effect of the depth that you estimate, and you use something like an arc sine hyperbolic transformation. And that's just because what you want to have is a transformation <coughs> so that your confidence intervals are not dependent on the level of X. So here, we have very narrow confidence intervals with the lower values and large ones here, but after the transformation, you have higher ones. Um, if you just took a log transformation, unfortunately, it, it works well at the high re regime, but, um, so it makes everything have a constant, but in the medium regime, it sort of squashes everything down and you don't see subtle changes. So we found that the arc sine hyperbolic works well, and that's what we use. And again, I don't have to persuade some people in the room that mixture models work mil miracles, and all kinds of nice um, mixture models work for different types of microbiome data. So we've often used beta binomial, zero inflated Poisson or Gaussian, and gamma Poisson, and these are all mixtures. Underlying that is beautiful probability theory. That is, most of these, uh, when you have measurements which are exchangeable, um, there's an underlying theory, which is De Finetti's theorem, that says that there's a mixture underlying it. And so, um, and you could have um, partial exchangeability and more general things. But there's actually a beautiful mathematical reason why mixtures are so effective. But um, I really think it's useful to think that. So we have this paper called Waste Not, Want Not, about not rarefying, which implements what I just told you about, about modeling the numbers of reads as something which is a function both of the prevalence of the taxa in the sample and the sample depth. And this is very much the same as what's done for RNA-seq. You can do a more sophisticated version of this if you have a lot if it's very sparse, so zero inflated negative binomial. Um, when we compared, we used the Aikaiki, and mostly the negative binomial fits pretty well. There are less parameters to fit. And you can see in this case that the simple Poisson model just doesn't fit. But the negative binomial, this is real data, they fit very well. Um, it fits the data themselves um, very well, and you can estimate the depth parameters using a non-parametric curve. Okay, so what is the consequences of some of this on experimental design when you're setting up your experiment? So here I said my goal, uh, you know, in, in, in going forward, I can't bring everything back to be uniform distribution. Most of this data counts. It's very hard you have a lot of sparse data. The data are never going to be normal. So 
you, you need to be able to make choices, at least so that you're equalizing variance. And um, the kind of experiment that we do, here I have a time point. I have different subjects. This is the antibiotic data I was showing you the perturbation of. And then we have these different um, ASVs. And you, often people ask, you know, well, I want to set up this longitudinal uh, experimental design. And one of the biggest changes, of course, is in these human microbiome samples, whether or not you use a sophisticated distance or just a Bray Curtis distance, the difference between subjects is everything. So you have to bring everything back in some sense to the center. So you center with each one of these uh, with regards to themselves, and then we can align them, um, as I was saying before, um, yesterday. But there's something else if you're doing a longitudinal study that you also want to take into account. And that's some, and again, the uniform always comes back. People in bioinformatics in particular really like it if the data are sampled at equal time points. It seems as if that's the most um, fairest. That's where you, you, know, you want to put the equal time points. And that's just the wrong thing to do. And so the equal time points, if you have a perturbation um, study, and this is uh, true for our antibiotic, our colonic clean-out, and our diet perturbations that we do, in that case, the subject is their own control. That is, the, it's the, to get rid of the between-subject variability, we're going to ask somebody to go through all the different perturbations. Now, we are lucky enough to live in the Bay Area. When we designed this study, we thought it would take us a year to recruit 100 people who would accept to go through colonic clean-out, antibiotics, a diet change. And then we put up a call on what's called the Quantified Self website. <coughs> and within a week, we were full. Unfortunately, our demographics were quite off because we had um, 100 men between the age of 25 and 40, who would have paid us to do this study because they're part of what's called the quantified self. So some of you are like that. You go around with all kinds of things. or you know, You're tracking yourself, every move, everything that you do, and so on. And so you're measuring yourself, and this was data for them where they could measure and so on. So we, we, we took you know, a proportion of these people, and then we had to go out and find you know, older women and different demographics, so it was more representative. But, um, but it was much easier to recruit than we thought. So we recruit these people, and the question is, you know, when do we sample? Well, when they take an antibiotic perturbation, what you want is, so here maybe this is every week, and here this is every day. And the reason for doing that is it's not the time. Time doesn't mean anything, chronological time in this case. What matters is the between point variances have to be about the same. So if you are in a time of high perturbation, eh, you want to have a lot of points. And of course, everybody who does you know, sample surveys or response service design um, and you know, spatial statistics knows this. But it is true that the bioinformaticians, for instance, don't know that. And so, so if, you have, if you know that you're putting in a perturbation, you want to measure a lot more around the perturbation. So the equal variance um, can be incorporated in the design. And this was our perturbation study. Um, this was the case of the clean-out, um, colonic clean-out. And we have very, very high density uh, um, during the... <laughs> just before and just after the clean-out. Um, many more points, so it's not equally spaced. Now, in doing the study of the longitudinal data, I want to circle back to sort of more classical statistics. Um, what I didn't tell you about the pregnancy study is we did something bad. Um, it's always the same. The... the, 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 the the biologists are always in a hurry. As soon as they get the data, you have a week to analyze it, get it out the door. This is really important. And uh, when they gave us the data, I realized that, okay, we have 
per woman, we had probably 10 or 15 measurements highly correlated. So you can't, when you're doing the testing and the uncertainty quantification, you can't suppose that those are independent samples. They don't count as independent samples. So I said, well, we'll be extra safe and we're going to amalgamate them. So we'll take an average per woman. But I knew that that was throwing away information, but I didn't know how much what information that was. That is, is 15 time points the equivalent of two points or four points or five points? And that's the, the question that I asked Prathipa. Um, she's a postdoc who works with me, and she specialized in the bootstrap. And I wanted to do uh, testing for longitudinal data of microbiome data. And she wrote a program called Boot Long. And what it does is it tries to find what is the ideal block size for the bootstrap so that you can test this longitudinal data. And um, so... So in the case where we have these table counts here, we have the different taxa in rows. We have the subject, and the subjects are at different time points. And we're going to try and find out. Um, so just to prove to you that, first of all, they're autocorrelated, you have this high correlation. You see that one or two, the vaginal microbiome makeup um, you know, of these different species is quite high. And we tried to look at the difference between term and preterm. We, don't, we didn't see big differences there, but we definitely saw um, high correlations. Um, and we wanted to find out how you can do the differential abundance analysis under that case. So we have a, a model, which is, again, this negative binomial mixture model, and <clears throat> where we, we take out the effect of the sample depth and do the transformation. And then... She uses a moving block bootstrap. So the idea there is, instead of resampling in the bootstrap each individual observation, you take three observations or four observations in a row, and that's a block. And then you take another four, and you put it. And so you make new samples, but they're by block. That's actually the way they should bootstrap when you're doing phylogenetic trees and trying to do the bootstrap, because along a DNA sequence, there's also a dependency. So you can't suppose that every position is independent. So this block bootstrap is something that I've recommended over the years, many cases, and I wanted to have a nice um, you know, algorithm which implements it. And so you create new data for each of the subjects using the data that you have, but making these different blocks. And these moving block bootstraps give you different values for the coefficients in, in your model, the, uh, whether it's a generalized um, mixed model or not, and we use that um, for our statistic. Now, there's a computational way of finding what the optimal block size is. And so in this case, um, we use a mean square error with a 70% subsample. And it's either 7 or 9. We preferred 7, but it shows you what the... Um, block sizes are. And we have a trade-off in some sense because you want more observations um, th th than... Th you want to have not too many observations in the block given the number that you have. And so the conclusions are a little bit more refined as to what bacteria are associated with preterm birth. Um, we still find that low lactobacilli, crispatus, um, Inus, Gassiri, Gen C, those are all associated. So if you have low values of that, that's associated to preterm birth. As we said, you know, those are the, the, those are the protective bacteria. And the high ones, again, the, most high, the highest is, again, the Gardnerella. Um, and, um, but we did find other ones. So it was a more subtle, more powerful study just by, with the same data. And we, we were using more of the information. So that's, um, I'm just going to finish off. As a summary, the similarities are very useful, but they can't be used alone. You need to put in distances and probability distributions at the same time. Um, real data are never uniformly distributed, unfortunately. And you have to find some approximation so you can equalize things and try to make um, equal variances. So 
um, by making transformations, but it's still something that needs a lot of work. Uh, we can design longitudinal uh, studies if you take into account interpoint variances, and specialized methods are available for testing you know, longitudinal and things like that. And finally, you know, try to keep as much as information all the way through. You might need it later on. You never know unless you do an actual you know, sufficient statistic computation saying, I can throw this out. You want to be keeping as much information all the way through as possible. And uh, so, again, uh, many of the principles, in particular about the arc sign and things like that, are in my book with Wolfgang. I'm thankful to the R Studio community and Nidder and Bioconductor and my lab group. <laughs> okay, you got your hand up first. <laughs> I, I, tried to, I tried to delay. So the, Try to delay. <laughs> the Betty number barcodes. Yes. So first of all, I appreciate all the more general points you made about them. But you also yeah, 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 said, yeah. And some of the reasons. I was trying to maintain the interest of pure mathematicians. Right. Okay. As a non-pure mathematician, yeah. if we could do it right, it would still be a bunch of betting number barcodes. Like, I've never seen a convincing connection of this deep topology to something practical in biology. So, what about if you had a, a asynchronized cell cycle? You'd be interested, wouldn't you? I would be interested in asynchronized cell yeah. cycles. Yeah. And you think betting number barcodes might be a good way to. It might. Okay. I mean,. I have your same skepticism because I have a lot of statistics tools, but I think that there are cases where, yeah, okay, if it was done in a way which I believed, the uniform distribution is absolutely not, you know, believable. I agree it's better to do it well. No, no, I mean, so biological, not, you know, can, can you think of biological data that sits on a torus? I don't know, you know, and, and, and but they do, they're trying to do, you know, structures of networks which are extremely... You know, like bands or something. There might be something there. I'm not, you know, I'm, but you have to, you have to be, you have to get real about the. There's a problem. There's an identifiability problem, which is differentiating between the case where you have very high curvature in your manifold and the case where you have very low curvature but very high density of points. Those give you the same projections down and the same Betty numbers. And so it doesn't work. So that, that, there's a beautiful open problem, and I'm not the one. Maybe somebody trained in Russia. But. <laughs> <laughs> so can I ask yes. A very simple question about uh, your making sure that you've got equal variance between your time yeah. samples. If you don't have a great deal of prior information no. about an experiment of that sort, what yeah. should you do? Or how do you determine that? The, the, the way we do it is uh, I do a lot of work uh, with what we call generative models. I make up a lot of data before I design an experiment. I make up data. So I simulate, and then I, you know, I look at various... Uh, Cases where I think this is, of course, it's exactly the same as the power calculation problem, which is, you know, many many biologists come and see me and they ask, you know, well, I, you know, what, I need to know what my sample size has to be here, and and you and you always say 15 in each group, right? And 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 um, that, and then they say, oh no, but I want to do three. I usually do three, and you tell them no. <laughs> it's just like, but. It's a, it's a circular thing because you can only know how many you needed so afterwards. And so you'll know, oh my goodness, it was underpowered. Bother. You know, I, should, I could have thrown the money away. But still, there's some intuition. That is, there were. So what happened for the antibiotic study, to be honest, was they had this first study that David Relman did, and I showed you the data for, where there were three patients. And we saw how much the patients changed in a, a couple of days. And we, that, that was done at regular intervals. And that was the preliminary data. And from that, we did some other back of the envelope. and said the average variance in this. 
So now we have to do. Now, of course, there are, there, there are constraints about the way the, the data are collected often, which make it so that your perfect design anyway, they can't do it. But you can still, it, I thought it was important enough to say, I've seen enough people come to me after the fact with experiments at equal time points that I thought it was worth saying out loud, that's all. Um, Yes. I, have, I don't see very many statisticians in the room, so I'm a little concerned about asking this question. But I'm thinking about variance stabilization. Yes. And one one alternative is to try to transform the data to make onto a scale that makes the variances approximately yeah. constant. And the other alternative is to use an explicit is to write down an explicit variance mean relationship. Yeah. And try to weight by that. Yeah. When you're, Absolutely. Do you right. have? Do you have? Is it just aesthetic, or do you? Or are there advantages to doing one or the other? I, I would say I do a bad mixture of both because I take out parts because I'm taking out the sample that which is sort of a transformation to get rid of some of it, and then I'm what's left over. I'm going to put into this variance stabilizing for both multiplicative and additive error, and I don't think it's optimal, but. You know, that's what we do. And the idea there is you can do, I mean, the variance mean relationship is sort of um, non parametric. You can make a non parametric and you can use that, and I think that's fine. At the level at which we're doing it, certainly. Do similar problems arise with process pathology with the mapper algorithm? With what? With the mapper algorithm. The mapper? Yeah. So in the mapper algorithm, you're trying to um, place um, on, the, um, on the tree, right? And the mapper algorithm has the same problem that we have often with trying to recognize species, which is it's extremely sensitive to the databases, to the data that you know. So one of the things that we have is that, of course, the tree which involves human pathogens is known with is exquisite resolution. And then, you know, soil bacteria is just like very, very coarse. And um, if you're looking at contaminants and things like that, they, they might not, they might, you might have some soil, but you won't have it with, and so we, you are influenced by the frequency in your database. So you do have a problem there, and that's something, you know, which I've had to worry about because I had databases which had to do with water, and my microbiome wasn't, you know, water related, and so you have this, this problem. I think definitely. I mean, these frequency and these biases that come up because of the da frequency in the database are, are something to worry about. And, uh, yes? Yeah, I wonder whether the lack of constancy of variance or lack of constancy, constancy in the means is responsible for the patterns you see in the uh, autocorrelation function for different lags. So I don't. So, so you have a, a plot over there where you see that the autocorrelations are not are not zero, say, or close to zero. There is a pattern in them. Yeah. Sometimes those patterns arise because the data do not have constant means or constant variances or both, even though they are independent. Yeah. So so so. Here, in the autocorrelations, we were, we were careful to do it at the level of the corrected number of reads, but not the proportions. So I think that the correlations were valid. Um, I know that the, there are huge problems when you look at correlations of the compositional data. Mm -hmm. If the data are all sum to one and you're looking at that, then that's very artificial. You can't interpret them. And really, the autocorrelations here, we're not making any inferences. We're just using them to say there is autocorrelation, that's all. I mean, the, the, we didn't look at the intensity of the autocorrelations at all. It was to have an idea about whether it was, and really what you should do is, you know, multivariate, you know, look at them um, the most. But it was just to say, you know, they exist. But, um, Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you.